Oh, greetings, everyone. This is the Raspberry Pi Forum for HRU 2021. Um, if you are expecting cooking classes, um, no, we're not actually making pies. Uh, although somebody gave me a hint in one of our numerous nets that we have up here in the frozen north that adding uh, baking baking powder to your pie crusts definitely improves them. I don't know, I haven't tried it yet, but we won't talk about stuff like that today. We're gonna talk about the Raspberry Pi where it came from, what it is, what you can do with it. Um, but I'd like to get a feel for um, the audience's expertise and involvement with pies first. So we're going to put up a little poll and that will give me an idea of everybody's experience with this. So George, if you can run our poll, everybody please answer the poll. We have 66% voted, Neil. Okay. Give it another 10 seconds. Yeah, that's fine. Seventy-five percent. Just let me know if it's still going up or it stops. <laughs> There is no spot for people that haven't used one. So if you haven't used one, just don't answer the poll at all. Perfect. Okay. So we're going to give it five more seconds and then we'll close it. And here's the results. Can you see it, Neil? I know it's coming because I froze. There we go. Okay. All right, that gives me an idea where everybody lands. Um, if you've attended the class before, I do run through the history um, and then we change it as the device evolves, which thank God uh, the Raspberry Pi is always evolving. So. And we have new things to talk about today. So let's run through the presentation real quick. Um, who am I? I don't know. Sometimes I forget, but I'm an IT professional. Um, I work in cancer research. I work with computers. Um, these days, uh, the bulk of my work is managing cloud systems, uh, but I still do a lot of high-end computer tech work um, in uh, Windows and Linux. I was, um, I've been in IT for 21 years now. It's uh, hard to hard to think that it's been that long. I was licensed at K2 as KD2 APZ in 2011. So I haven't been a ham all that long, but um, I picked up my first shortwave radio when I was a little kid. Uh, I've been around radios and electronics my whole life. It's always been my main hobby. Um, I'm now living up here in the Hudson Valley. Uh, you can see my, my wonderful office here. Um, we just uh, picked up this house um, as soon as uh, we were able to start looking at houses after the pandemic real estate restrictions were being lifted and uh, very happy up here. Um, I am on the web. I have a website. Uh, NeilGoldstein.com is kind of the launching place for some of the websites I have, but the active one is called Fofio. So, and uh, there's a little explanation of who Fofio is on that page. Uh, I maintain a site called radiokitguide.com, which is a, a list, a little out of date. Uh, I need to update it. It was updated earlier in the year, but it's a list of the uh, do-it-yourself radio kits that are available online, transmitters, receivers, transceivers, and uh, sources for accessories also. My email address on here is uh, w2ndg at radiokitguide.com, or you can also email me at neil at neilgoldstein.com. We did the poll already. So we're gonna look over just the whole aspects of the pie, what it is, where it came from, what you can do with it, what you can't do with it. So let's dive in. Um, 
the most simple way to talk about a Pi is that it's a computer, a very small, inexpensive computer. I mean, for size reference, next to my large head, there's the Pi. And that's just one of them. It has the same components you have in a large system um, or the equivalents, input, output, memory, storage, audio, video, more. Sorry about that. Um, a Raspberry Pi is not the same thing as an Arduino or other microcontroller, microcontroller specific systems. There are a lot more than Arduino now. Uh, it does have a GPIO bus, which is one of the big things about the Arduino world. Uh, so you can do many Arduino-like things with it. But um, in some ways, that makes it the best of both worlds. Um, microcontrollers are better for embedded use. Um, where you don't need necessarily uh, a user interface uh, that keeps changing, but there are plenty of uh, crossovers now. Um, and I know that somebody will pop up in the chat and tell me about the Arduino that has a full computer ability and the ability to be a web server and Wi-Fi built in. I, I know, and also that you know the Pi can pretty much go in that same direction also. Yes, but for uh, purposes of simplification, um, we'll draw a line there. Um, system on a chip, you'll hear this term SOC used a lot when we deal with these small systems and even your cell phones. Um, and SOC integrates a lot of components into one small package. It's used in a lot of small appliance-like project or products. So, you know, the Pi, uh, your cell phone, um, your microwave oven, if it's brand new, possibly your refrigerator. Um, there's an SOC, probably more than one, somewhere in your car. But depending on what it needs to do, they can be more sophisticated than others. The one in the Pi is fairly sophisticated. You'll hear the term RISC when people talk about the Pi. Um, RISC stands for Reduced Instruction Set Computing. This is something that Apple really, really pushed hard on when their Macs were uh, PowerPC based. Um, RISC is a more efficient way of running a processor. So that's why, um, pardon the pun, when Apple always compared their products to others, they always said, you're not comparing apples to apples. Uh, but it was true. You, can't, you couldn't look at the megahertz rating of a RISC processor and compare it directly to the megahertz rating of an Intel x86 processor. Uh, they're not the same thing. They work completely differently. And now Apple is pushing back into the RISC world with their main computer lines. So it should get interesting. Um, the uh, ARM Cortex A53, which at this time was in the Pi 3 when I put this slide together, uh, you can't compare apples to apples with speed and RAM if you're going to compare that to one of these cheap Windows laptops that's running an x86 processor. February 2012, um, the original Pi was released to the public and their main goals were accessibility and education. And I bring up the BBC Micro here from Acorn Computing. And uh, the, the Beeb, as they called it, was a project that the British government subsidized to get children involved in computing. And it was a great idea and they sold a lot of those computers. And that was, the original focus of the Raspberry Pi. And to this day, it still comes with a lot of basic development software that's really good for kids and adults too. Um, there's nothing that says that we can't use some of this software if you want to learn how to code. Um, and just as a side note, when we talk about other single board computers and things you can learn to code on, um, the Beeb or BBC has come up with a, a newer single board tiny computer. Um, it's interesting. It's nowhere near as sophisticated as the Pi, but it's a great starting point for people who want to learn. So these are some of the original Pis. The Model A, which they still make a Model A, it's based on uh, one of the Pi 3s now, was a stripped down Raspberry Pi. Uh, it doesn't have as many ports, doesn't have as many accessories and features. It usually runs a slightly slower processor than the B model. Um, why? Why would you want this? Power. Um, if you're designing something that needs to run low power, 
either off of solar or long term on a battery, um, something remote, something portable, um, the A is worth looking at. This was the original Model B, and this was 700 megahertz single core processor, 512 megs of RAM. The first models, which I have one, has only 256 megabytes of RAM. Um, that one um, was put into duty as a print server in my home for years. It worked well for that, uh, but they were really slow for a lot of other things. They had two USB ports, an Ethernet port, which was USB derived. So it was only as fast as the USB subsystem. Um, composite video out, you can see that giant RCA connector on the top, analog audio right next to it, and it took a full size SD card. So that was the original design. The B plus changed the form factor slightly. The board has always been the same size, but the B plus is the layout that they used straight through till the four came out. It was the same speed, but they improved the layout of the board. They added more USB ports and they improved the voltage regulator, which was a big deal. They also switched to uh, micro SD cards to save space. and. Uh, less complex and less expensive connector when you use the, the micros. Uh, the giant uh, composite jack disappeared and got integrated into the audio jack. These all have uh, full-size HDMI video, by the way. Raspberry Pi 2, still the Model B, but the 2 up the speed to 900 megahertz and a quad-core processor. Um, one gigabyte of RAM now. And form factor and most everything else still the same. They improved uh, little things, integrated more components, improved the layout a little. But it's uh, here with the three that things got really interesting because now we added Wi Fi and Bluetooth. So this is now uh, where the Pi has got a lot more useful because there were ways to set them up completely headless. Um, and it still works that way. There's a, a way you can load a file in the root directory of the little micro SD card when you set up a Raspberry Pi that will automatically connect it to a specific Wi-Fi network that you choose when it powers up. And then you can um, do a, a command line interface to it, uh, SSH, and uh, change things, change your password, get a uh, remote VNC server, which is a uh, remote video starting. And uh, you can completely set up one of these without hooking it up to a keyboard and a monitor and an ethernet connection. Really nice. So thanks for out in the field. So Raspberry Pi 3B plus model now, 1.4 gigahertz quad core, dual band Wi-Fi, better Bluetooth, form factor still the same. Uh, option of power over ethernet on this one now. And that was the end of that form factor. The Raspberry Pi 4 now changes that. So this is uh, the 4's layout changed. You can see the HDMI port is gone. Now we have two micro HDMI ports. So it'll run two monitors, but you do need an adapter to hook them up now. Uh, they're still with this one is uh, composite video and analog audio in the eighth inch jack, but now we've switched to USB-C power. They used to be micro USB power before. And now two of the USB ports are USB three and two are USB two. And now, because we have a USB 3 subsystem, the Ethernet can get faster. So the Ethernet port is now gigabit. Uh, one of the big changes here, though, is you can now get a Raspberry Pi 4 with two, four, or eight gigs of RAM. And it has a one and a half gig quad core processor now, ARM version 8. Um, an eight gig one is pretty much usable as a desktop computer at this point. Uh, this was just a great improvement. I have a few of these. Um, we'll talk about which ones I have and what they're set up for when we get out of the presentation. But 
those of you seeing the 64 bit who didn't realize this or are seeing this for the first time, um, there isn't an official 64 bit OS for the Pi yet. It's coming. They're working on a 64 bit version of what's now called Raspberry Pi OS, which used to be called Raspbian. This is the Raspberry Pi Zero. Um, this came out during the run. One gigahertz, single core, 512 megs of RAM. It has one micro USB port. I know it looks like it has two, but one of them is for power. So you need what's called an OTG adapter, uh, which is a little micro to full size USB adapter to hook up any peripherals to it, or um, a powered USB hub to hook up more than one peripheral. So the original one, that was kind of tough because you would need an ethernet port for it. Um, it was uh, interesting to try to get these up and running, but there was plenty you can do with them. Um, you can see at the, the header row there, uh, they give you a header usually in the package when you buy one of these. And if you're going to use it, you have to solder it on. Um, not too hard if you've done basic soldering, but you can order them with the header already on them if you would like. Uh, the HDMI port on these is mini HDMI, yet another standard and another adapter. This is halfway between full-size HDMI and micro HDMI as far as the size. I would expect a new zero at some point using the micro HDMI, so it's aligned with the four, but for now, they haven't done that yet. Then we got the Pi Zero W. Still one gigahertz single core, 512 megs of RAM but uh, has a micro, um, it's still the micro USB port, but now we have uh, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, making it much easier to do one of those headless setups to get it going um, or connect um, keyboard and mouse without having to worry about USB. So, and one thing that I uh, haven't mentioned with either, either of these is that they're usually $5, depending on where you go and get them. Um, I did pay less than five once. I paid $4 for one once and I got one free once. So they were even offered free on a magazine at one point. This is the excitement this year. This is the new Raspberry Pi 400. And uh, I have to tell you that it is a lot of fun. As you can see, if you're looking at my picture, I'm holding one up, but um, on the screen, that's a good rendition of it. What they did was they took the design of the Raspberry Pi 4, um, they did bump up the processor a little bit, and uh, they changed it to a linear layout. So all of the ports are along one edge of the card. And you can see I'm, I show the, the board that's inside of the Pi 400 here next to the Pi 4. Um, a lot of people have complained about the form factor, the layout of the Raspberry Pis can be a little infuriating if you're not using their official cases and trying to embed it in something else. Um, this does line everything up, and I believe at some point, if not already, they're planning on offering the board by itself, which will be nice. Uh, it's a little faster, 1.8 gig. They're offering it with 4 gigs of RAM, and it has basically the same features as the 4, except they did away with the composite uh, combined audio and video jack. So that's gone. Um, the uh, GPIO bus is open on the back and it's horizontal. And uh, it's a form factor that uh, you can get uh, connectors for easily and uh, make your own breakout for it. It's pretty nice built-in keyboard and much improved cooling, which has been a, an issue with the 4. The 4 does tend to run hot. If you're going to use it for some of the ham radio things that we talk about, uh, you really need to make sure that it is properly cooled. There's a layout of the 3. I'll skip over that. We've talked about most of it, this. The layout changes of the 4. So this page has drastically changed recently. There used to be a lot more on this page available for the Pi. Um, then if you just Google operating systems for Raspberry Pi, you'll find others. Um, and there are some interesting ones, but these are now the only official ones on the Pi page. Raspberry Pi OS, which is the new name of Raspbian, um, Liberlec, 
which is for Libre, Libre Elec, depending on how you want to pronounce this, um, which is a Cody based uh, entertainment center. Um, Cody being um, a set top box, basically, basically make your own uh, Roku like device out of a Raspberry Pi and uh, Ubuntu desktop. I've tried the earlier versions of Ubuntu on the Pi. I wasn't thrilled. Um, there were some some bugs that caused issues. Um, I haven't tried it lately, and I'll probably have to go back and try it again. I know they'll eventually get to a good version, but Raspbian and now Raspberry Pi OS have been around long enough that they've really got it down, and it's very refined. So. What are its limitations? Um, mentioned before, because of the Pi's ARM architecture, only programs that are compiled to run in an ARM environment are going to work. Um, and not everything compiles for ARM. A lot of things do, and you'll find a lot of familiar apps, but there will be some missing. In particular, Wine. And Wine is uh, its one of those recursive names that uh, the Linux nerds love. Um, it stands for Wine is not an emulator. And the wine layer on Linux allows you to run Windows programs natively right on the Windows desktop. Um, it won't, it, it's not going to work um, on the Pi. Uh, someone was trying to make it work. Um, last year, when I was talking about the Pis, there was a project running uh, to get these things up and running, but the project has ended and they were unsuccessful. They did get it to work with some software, but it was so slow and slow bug, so buggy that. Uh, they ended the project. So um, what about Windows? Um, I thought I heard that Windows would run on the Pi. So that's uh, interesting. There was originally on that software page um, a version of Windows for the Pi. It was called Windows for IoT or Internet of Things. Um, it was based on the old code that Microsoft had come up with to make um, to make the Pi, to make Windows run on the original um, tablets that they had come out with. Um, if you're familiar with the Surface Pro, there was originally a regular non-Pro Surface that was ARM-based, and they came up with an ARM version of Windows 8 for it. Uh, Windows IoT kind of grew out of that project because those original um, ARM-based um, tablets are not made anymore. Now they have a newer ARM-based Windows, and they've developed a new version of ARM Windows to run. People have already managed to hack um, ARM-based Windows onto the Pi. Um, I got it onto one of mine, I got it to boot, I got it up to a Windows screen, and I couldn't do anything with it because I was having trouble getting the uh, the hack to make the USB drivers work. So I had no keyboard or mouse, but I did have it up and running. And I'll try it again, but it doesn't run too fast, but it's not bad on the four. So something to play with if you're one of those people who likes to do things just because you can. Um, Android. I keep hoping for this, but it still has never really happened. Um, Broadcom has not opened up Android support for their SOC. Um, there are a bunch of Pi alternatives that use it because they use chips that uh, the chip manufacturers have worked with, um, with with Google to get Android to run on them, but not with uh, the Broadcom SOC and the Pi. So uh, there was a project to get it up and running, but once again, same thing like with uh, the wine emulator. It was just so slow and slow, so buggy that they they really abandoned it. So um, the other contenders, um, and I coined this phrase, the Cranberry Deluxe Mini. Uh, someone is probably going to come out with that board or already has. Um, so I, I'll, someone will say the Cranberry Deluxe Mini or insert generic name here is much better than the Raspberry Pi. People will always tell me that they tried this or that and it was faster, it had more ports, you could plug a, a, a SATA hard drive into it. Um, that's fine. There are so many of these projects that have come up and there's lots of alternatives, but uh, some of them will work in certain specific applications like the Kiwi SDR project, which is a really cool project that runs on the Beagle boards, which is another credit card size SOC based computer. Um, the uh, Latte Panda, which was a real Windows x86 or x86 compatible mini board that will run Windows, um, but that one costs quite a bit more. Um, 
the reason why the pies still win in all of these categories is uh, there's so many out there. We really don't see the company disappearing anytime soon. It's just so insanely popular. Um, and, and some of the others have come and go. Um, there's a particular one which I'll show you called Chip, um, which I was starting to do some experimenting with, and uh, the chip is gone. They went out of business. Um, so uh, throw into Google alternatives to Raspberry Pi, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, and when something is that popular, the support for it is fantastic. Um, there's so much information and so many forums and so many web pages and YouTube videos devoted to doing this or that or everything on the Pi. Um, you know, in my uh, little ham radio club that I've gotten involved in up here in the Catskills, um, there's a lot of pie enthusiasts and even among a small group like us we start talking about the pie and we go on for hours and hours and everybody is an expert in a different part of that hobby what can you do with it it's basically a computer it should be able to do anything that a computer can do um, it's not going to be fast as a modern desktop but i mean a, a model 4 or the 400 is pretty much as fast as one of these, uh, you know, bargain Black Friday laptops that you'll buy at Walmart, probably faster, certainly more reliable. Um, but you have the addition of the, the GPIO, GPIO bus, so you can interface with the world around you, control things, uh, hook up sensors, um, hook up other alternative devices, um, and the size of it. This gives you uh, so much more you can do in places that you wouldn't be able to shoehorn a full-size computer. Uh, just a basic list, small desktop computer, a media center, like I mentioned with uh, the, the one I have set up here, music player, uh, and that's an, an upcoming project of mine, uh, weather station, um, <laughs> and uh, we're all running weather stations up here now. Uh, you can actually build your own out of the Pi. There's even uh, a Pi-based OS for the weather station. Um, robotics, web-enabled controllers, education, um, remote camera terminals, thin clients. Um, if you have a Windows machine like on your workbench or in your shack that you need to control from somewhere else in your house frequently, you can just remote desktop into it from a Pi. Gaming, kiosks, small servers, so the list is endless. Um, that one I mentioned here, web-enabled controller. Um, I have a friend who built a uh, whole monitoring system for his uh, microbrew setup, home brewing. And of course, the reason we're here, ham radio. So um, we're limited to what runs on Linux. And then from that set of programs, we're limited to what programs in or Linux can be recompiled or have been recompiled for ARM. Um, FL Digi, um, some rig control apps, SDR applications, linking, APRS, packet. Um, but some of the uses that come off of this are ADSB airplane tracking, which is really neat, um, remote SDR server, uh, full fledged SDR from the Pi 3, I'd say B plus and higher only. Um, the other ones weren't really fast enough, which is where you would only be able to do the remote SDR server. Nope, did not mean to leave that slide. Um, digital radio hotspot. Um, <laughs> I know there's a lot of those out there and I'm planning on building a couple more. Um, Echolink node, you, know, you can do Echolink. APRS, Whisper, antenna rotator controls, TNC, um, a spectrum monitor. PSK31 terminal and others, um, rig control, and there's even uh, a whole piece of hardware based on the Pi now for that rig Pi from MFJ, and uh, even as a transmitter. So when I say it can be used as a transmitter, I mean that the Pi itself can actually transmit an RF signal. Um, the GPIO pins can be modulated at a high enough frequency that RF will come out of them. Um, somebody in the early days of the Pi discovered this and came up with a very interesting project, which was called Pi FM. 
Uh, it was a very simple Linux distribution. It just booted up to a command line. Um, you run this thing headless. You load the distribution onto your micro SD card. You put a config file in the root of your SD card, giving the frequency you want to transmit on and a couple of uh, parameters about your music files. You then load the root directory with uh, MP3s and other music files that are supported. And uh, when you boot it up, it just starts playing in whatever order you designated in your config file. Uh, it's very low power, or at least it needs to be, um, because if you hook this up to a large antenna, um, it may not be legal. <laughs> and trust me, it transmits a lot further than you think it will if you hook up a large antenna to it. But it does work, and it's a neat proof of concept. Um, other people were able to get other modes running on it, AM, FM, SSB. Um, it can be used as a, a really neat low power uh, fox hunt transmitter, and uh, you can get into more sophisticated uses. So this is the Whisper Pi from uh, Tapper, the Tucson Amateur Radio Amateur Packet Radio Group. Um, they offer a couple of interesting kits and boards. Um, they have something called uh, the Whispering Pi. You can get it from their website, available in different bands. And it fits on top of the Raspberry Pi, sometimes called a hat for the Pi. And you can transmit whisper signals right out of the Pi with this board. Really neat. And this board adds the proper filtering uh, to make that signal legal. It's still very low power, but whisper doesn't need to be high power. It's the whole point of it. Um, QRP guys had a kit version of this, all through hole soldering. Um, unfortunately, the kit itself is gone, at least until after uh, COVID, but not sure if it'll come back. But right now you can still buy the board for $10 and then buy the components and populate it yourself. The instructions are still on the website. Ian Lee, uh, KD8CEC, uh, does a lot of projects for the ham radio community. Uh, his, one of his most famous ones was his aftermarket firmware for the UBITX transceiver. Um, he started working on a project to combine the UBITX and a Raspberry Pi for a more sophisticated device. And as part of that, he developed a portable version of WSJTX for small displays. So you could technically buy one of these UBITX boards and a small touchscreen Pi setup and using Ian's software, create a little digital mode terminal in one package. Um, both of the online SDR projects you'll see, WebSDR and uh, OpenWebRx, which is now at kiwisdr.com, um, both will work with a Raspberry Pi. Um, you'll get a more simple single band out of the uh, Kiwi. Um, Compared to uh, running uh, the, the BeagleBone one, which runs a very wide band receiver, but you can pick this up on one band. Um, I was running a six meter one down in Long Island for a while. Um, Web SDR project, similar, but uh, to get the server software, you have to contact the author and tell him where you're setting up your receiver and a few other things because he likes to approve first and then he'll send you the software that runs on the Linux backend. TNC Pi, special version of TNCX, designed uh, for the Raspberry Pi. The digital hotspots, and uh, this is actually mine, running. Um, really interesting. And for those of you who don't know what these are, I know it, it, there are very few people who don't at this point, but it's. Uh, a tiny repeater basically. Uh, this one is a simplex repeater and it picks up from uh, a digital radio, either uh, D-Star, um, Yesu System Fusion or uh, DMR radio and, and others. Those are the more popular ones and uh, will pick up your handheld or, or base radio and relay you into the internet and hook you into the networks that are part of all of those modes. Uh, DMR being the largest and most common one. Uh, if you live somewhere where there isn't an active DMR repeater or you're traveling somewhere where there isn't one, these are great for using your DMR HT to get into DMR talk groups. You can also do cross modes on them. 
go in with one mode and come out with another. And we've been working with some of our members up here who only have Yesu system fusion radios to get them into our uh, DMR talk group. So it does work. You can take the more sophisticated uh, setups on these with um, full duplex ones and actually make a digital repeater out of them. So the Pi 4 is now fast enough to actually create a portable digital terminal. And I'll show you mine when we get through the presentation. Um, they're fast enough. Uh, Pi 4, and um, you can use one of those dedicated mode radios. If you're on my uh, FT8 forum before, I was showing some of those quickly. Um, the most advanced one being from Midnight Design Solutions, uh, K1, SWLs, Phaser. Um, or just a small QRP rig. Um, most of them will interface to uh, uh, digital modes. Sometimes you have to make your own audio interface for uh, if you're using something like a micro bit X, but most of these commercial radios you can buy ready-made interfaces for. A lot of them just use uh, built-in sound cards now. So you're just plugging in a USB cable. Found this book. Um, you just look for Raspberry Pi for ham radio and you'll get a lot of information, but uh, there's a couple of books in this one, Amshack Raspberry Pi. Also, there are a number of group, groups I owe groups for this now, um, Raspberry Pi for ham radio being uh, one of them. But if you Google uh, Raspberry Pi into groups IO or search in groups IO, you'll definitely find some more of them. Only a couple more slides. All right, I have this running. I'm going to show it to you briefly. And I can even take questions while we're doing a little of the show and tell, George, so we can do that. Um, this is uh, a ham who wrote a ham radio specific Raspberry Pi image. It's built on Raspberry Pi OS and it has all of the apps preloaded, um, including the back end and drivers for some of the more popular hardware devices like the RTL SDR dongles or the uh, SDR play radios. Um, really handy and saves a lot of time. So um, I will post this, um, the presentation itself, and then I'll have the equivalent of a handout sheet on my webpage with clickable links for anything that uh, we discussed on the screen or anything that comes out of the questions. If there are any questions I can't answer immediately, uh, we can do that. So. Let me uh, end the presentation here. Neil, we do have a bunch of questions. All right. Um, I'm still sharing uh, my large screen here? Yes. OK. So uh, you can start asking questions. I'm just going to uh, work the slideshow into it a little bit. <laughs> OK. Um, what is the best way to power up a Raspberry Pi 4 in a Go kit using a 12? Volt Viano battery. It needs to get five volts for the for the Pi. That is a great question, and it's one that I'm probably going to answer. It'll be the first question I answer when I post my my posts because um, I can think of a number of ways to do that, but the best way, I'm not exactly sure. Um, I know what I would probably do is uh, like I when I work portable, I have a uh, uh, lithium ion jump start pack I work off of one of the nicer ones and um, that one has USB um, regular USB jacks on it for power output and they're pretty high amperage um, what I've done with mine uh, even the one with the built-in screen is when I'm working portable I have it on a separate power supply I buy one of the larger cell phone uh, battery backups um, and I can usually get hours and hours out of that thing on the Pi. And if you have more than one, then you have uh, something else to go to. Um, if I, uh, let me stop sharing for a minute. All right, so for those of you who can see me, uh, George, I assume they get a larger version of me now? <laughs> yes. Okay. okay. So what is the correct way to shut down a Pi with no monitor? Um, so Linux is more resilient than other operating systems, but they never did give you a, 
you know, a good way to shut it down if you're not on a monitor. Um, so the most common way is to terminal into an SSH, um, make an SSH connection into it. Make sure you change your Raspberry Pi passwords if you're going to turn on your SSH because everybody out there knows that the default password is Raspberry. So you can change that, but you can uh, run a terminal into it and issue the uh, Linux shutdown command. Um, which I believe is uh, shutdown hyphen H and then uh, dash now for immediate. Um, you can look up the exact syntax of that. I might have it wrong, but uh, you can shut down the Pi from the command line. Um, you can do a little bit of automation. Uh, there are apps that'll watch for certain events and you could have it set up where if you uh, send a message to the Pi, uh, let's say via email, to a specific email account that it watches for a specific message with a specific subject line. And when it gets that, it shuts down. It's a little harder to do, but it's neat and it does work. So um, for the power question, I just want to show real quick. This is a $5 battery backup pack. It's good for an emergency after the other packs fail, but for running the pies without the display, this will run it for a very long time. Um, I was buying these at a chain store called Five Below. They work very well. They last a lot longer than you would think. All right. Okay, uh, Neil, the next question is, can the Raspberry Pi running Raspbian make use of the sound cards in most of the newer radios, or does it require a signal link? Yes. Um, that's what I was saying. So if you have a radio with a sound card in it, like my ICOMs do, um, you can definitely use, um, you can just use one of the uh, plug-in USB sound cards. Um, let me share my screen again real quick here. And uh, I'm just going to run through a couple of slides real quick. All right, let me get to that one. This is uh, an example. This is just a USB sound card. It's the one I use here. Um, and uh, it, it works very well. So this is for a radio that doesn't have the built-in um, USB sound card, like like the um, attendee is asking. So, but if you have something like uh, the ICOM, um, I have it plugged right into my Pi 400, and it works great. You just have to disseminate which audio device it is when you're doing the setups, because uh, that can get confusing. Once you know which audio device it is. Um, you should have a clear shot at it. I've found WSJTX a lot easier to set up at first than uh, um, FL Digi. And even if you're not planning on running FT8, if you can get the config to work in FT8 uh, on WSJTX first, then you can take those parameters and plug them into uh, FL Digi. Okay, Neil, the next question is, I am not a software programmer. How hard is this to program? <laughs> Well, software programming is as hard or easy than um, the environment and the, the software you're using to get into that environment. And that's apparent on, on any device, on any computer. Um, the Pi indirectly is easier than other devices because out of the box, the Raspbian or Raspberry Pi OS operating system comes with some really great learning software for programming. But programming, as far as programming the Pi, it's not a um, like a uh, microcontroller board. When you boot the Pi up, you have a full operating system. You're not really programming it to do things. You're installing software and configuring the software to do things. The programming part comes where you write your own uh, software or scripts or, or routines to handle things for you. Um, that's where the programming comes in. But this is really 90% of what you're going to do with a Pi does not require you to know how to program. And if you can operate Windows, you should be able to operate Linux. It's not that much different if you're going to use the graphical user interface. If you have to do things from the command line, there is so much information out there that you can pretty much just copy and paste the commands, sometimes with a couple edits for your own information, right into the uh, terminal software and go from there. Okay, the next question is, are these modules upgradable? For example, adding more memory? 
No. Um, you can't add more memory. You can't improve on the video. Um, there's really no expansion for things like that. Um, the storage is um, upgradable because you can put different size uh, micro SD cards into them. Uh, they will accept USB storage and the newer versions of um, the Raspberry Pi OS and older ones with some hacking um, will boot off of a USB device. So you could run them off of a USB hard drive. Um, but as far as upgradability, you're stuck with what you can add externally to it. Um, so that's why if you're going to buy a Pi 4, um, buy the 8 gig version. It's it's not that much more money and uh, you'll be much happier for it. Unless, of course, like I mentioned, if you're building something that requires really, really low power, buy an A model or a zero. Okay, Neil, the next question. When will the Raspberry Pi 400 be available for sale? Uh, it's available now. Um, I have one here. As I, uh, I know not everybody was probably here right at the beginning, um, but I'm using one. And uh, if I, uh, I know we're short on time, 50 minutes is never enough. <laughs> but um, we can go a little bit longer because you're the last four. Okay, that's fine. Um, I want to do uh, a quick uh, VNC session into one of these before we we finish up. So I'm going to put the screen back up now. But yeah, I have a Pi 400 here. It's great. Um, I installed, uh, I did not use HamPy on it. I installed Raspberry Pi OS and uh, I added um, the ham apps to it that I'm using. Okay, we got about 10 more questions. So I'll give you a couple more. Um, what radio will connect directly to the Pi? Draws hat with the supplied mini DIN cable? Not sure I, know, I know what that is, but I'm going to have to uh, put that one in the after the after answers. Um, okay. I've seen that, and I haven't worked with it yet. All right. I will uh, post something about that on my page. Okay. Does the Pi 400 have output on the back side of the keyboard for video Arduino HDMI video? So I'll stop uh, screen again here. Here's mine. Um, this connector here and the one next to it, which isn't connected, these are HDMI micro HDMIs. So you'll need, like I have here, I have a micro HDMI to HDMI cable or an adapter hook regular HDMI up to it. What we lost was that eighth inch plug that had composite video out and audio. So no more analog audio, at least from the back of the Pi. I believe you can figure it, you can configure it to get it out of the GPI, GPI opens. Okay, how do I set up Pi 400 on SDR.org? So webSDR.org? It just says SDR.org, I would assume, yes. Okay. You have to, like I was saying, you have to email um, the guy who runs that whole system and request the software and tell him that you're going to be running it on a Pi. It's, um, there's definitely a high level of difficulty with, uh, with his setup. Um, I did it with a regular Linux computer. I have not done it on a Pi yet. Um, but you're limited to, you know, RTL SDR, I think. Uh, maybe he's added more devices since then. Um, but his thing is, is uh, he wants to approve your receiver first because he has uh, like too many of the same type on the same band in similar places. He's looking for something new. There's not as many in the States. So most cases, if you ask him, you want to put one up in the States, he'll say yes and help you get the software going. Okay, next question. Can a Pi run a low-power Wi-Fi mesh network like an intranet intended for neighbors on a street? I believe so. And I don't know the answer to that definitely, but I remember uh, when we were getting involved with uh, the ham mesh systems on the Linksys RTL, or the Linksys uh, routers, um, 
somebody had written a version of it for the Pi. I don't know where it went. I don't know if it's um, a finished project at this point, but um, it, someone was working on that. So I'm pretty sure, um, and, and now that I think of it, uh, one of the operating systems that disappeared from the OS page at raspberrypi.org um, was for mesh networking. Um, I would just Google Raspberry Pi Mesh OS, and you should find that. I think it's exactly what it was, and it may even have evolved out of that um, ham mesh uh, project. Okay, any opinions on remote control using the RIG Pi MFJ1234 and 1234B, which is Raspberry Pi based? I've read good reviews of of the uh, the new Rig Pi. Um, they've um, they've taken an open source, inexpensive project and kind of merged it into a more commercial, more expensive device. Um, if you look at what it does, um, it's uh, it's it's definitely interesting. It's probably worth the money if it works as well as they say. The actual project is open source i know initially there were some complaints that nobody could get access to the operating system but i believe they can now you could technically build one of these yourself um, but so far everything i've heard about it sounds good i haven't purchased one the reason is is that i'm running um, the uh, rcf orb remote server which is a windows only uh, back-end server, but before we moved, I had it up and running on my ICOM 7300, and that was a free project that just runs on a Windows PC um, and works quite well from uh, remotehams.com. Um, I may at some point try um, the RigPi, though. It does seem like it's more versatile, and because there's some money behind it, it'll probably be a little more stable than the free one. So um, more to come on that. I think uh, if I do this again next year, I may even have one. So uh, watch the uh, watch the web page. If I buy one, I'll post about it. Okay, we'll go about five more minutes. There are a whole bunch more questions, but we're not going to get to all of them. All right. Um, this one fellow wants to know about Node Red. We are using Node Red on a Pi for station integration. That one I don't know about. And I've written it down. Okay. okay. Uh, with the lack of an audio jack on the Raspberry Pi 400, is there still a way to get audio into and out of it for interfacing with a transceiver? I think you answered this, but you want to just comment again? Yeah. I mean, um, you know, I'll share the screen again. It was, uh, you know, that device. <laughs> uh, these USB audio dongles are really inexpensive. A um, little word of warning, though, we'll, uh, quick here. Um, the issue you run into these is that whereas the output is stereo to channel, very frequently with these, the input, at least with the inexpensive ones, is not. Now that usually won't matter for most of what we do, but if you're doing something like um, the uh, Softrock RXTX SDR, um, that requires stereo in both directions because you're dealing with two channels, I and Q, for SDR. So you can't use the one I have up on the screen now for that. You have to get a much more sophisticated one and be careful because even in the description, it'll say stereo mic. Sometimes it's not. Even if you ask the vendor, if you're dealing with like an eBay or AliExpress vendor, if it is, they'll tell you it is. Frequently, it's not. You got to spend a few dollars to get one that is or Google it. Uh, find out if somebody else has, and I'm sure there is, someone who's done it before you will tell you which one to get. Okay, another question. Which is your preference, ham pie, build a pie, or install your own apps? <laughs> I think um, I like ham pie because of its re refinement. It's been um, it, it's been very stable for me. It's worked really well. Um, most of what I've thrown at it has worked, and I haven't had to do much reconfiguring. And it's great for trying things out. If you're purpose building a project. If you are making like you know a portable Pi terminal to do um, FT8 and PSK31, for example, um, install Raspberry Pi OS and put the Pi, put the uh, the applications in separately. 
um, because there's less overhead then. You're not running as many services, you're not loading up as many drivers. Um, so it depends on what you're going to do with it. Definitely try HamPy. I'm not familiar. What was the other one that was mentioned? Uh, build a pie. Build a pie. I'm, I'm not familiar. Not as familiar with that one. I wrote it down. Um, but HamPy to try everything out. And if you're actually going to be using this like a tool, um, then I would go with installing the apps yourself. And uh, quick, another word. If you're installing things like w WSJTX or uh, something like FL Digi, go to the web page of the developer first, get the current version for your version of Linux, um, and try to get the most current version installed. Sometimes if you're just doing it from the package manager, you're not getting the newest version. Be aware of that. Do you have an example of a Raspberry Pi connected to an amateur transceiver? I do. And uh, we have VNC here, and I'm going to have to uh, get that over onto the shared screen. Which transceiver? I have an ICOM IC7100. Sorry about that, failure to launch. All right, let's show the screen again. Um, so if everybody can see the screen, I have three Pies here I can connect to. Uh, one of them is uninteresting, um, but the Pi 400 is on here and it is currently connected to my 7100. So here's the Pi 400 screen. And I have both FL Digi and WSJTX here. Let's run that. And how are they interfaced with the IC7100? So with the ICOM IC7100, it's a single USB cable. That I'm running. That's it. And if you go into uh, the setup here, real quick, and go into the radio tab, you'll see I have it IC7100. The serial port is TTY USB 0, zero in my case. I have my bought at 19200. I'm not going to go with all the settings, but just so you see, this is the stuff that you have to work out. And there's plenty of web pages that'll help you work it out. On the audio, you can see. It's it's not always what you think it's going to be. This one is also input USB Burr Brown from TI USB audio codec. Uh, frequently at the ICOMs, even when you plug them into Windows machines, you'll see this phrase USB audio codec. So that's how I knew it was probably the right one. But um, as you can see, I've got a waterfall running here and I'm getting spots. Um, this is working. And if I double click one of them, it will transmit. And I can change bands and everything. If you look at the display, I'll go to 30 meters. I'm going to spin my tuning knob a little. And you'll see the frequency is changing. So I've got cat control in both directions. This is just the WJST software doing all that work. Yes, that's all it was. That's all I installed was WSJTX, no other helper apps. Um, there are some other pitfalls you may run into in Linux, but the newer versions of Raspberry Pi OS get you around most of them. Um, as long as you are the original, um, what they call Pi user, or you've created a new user that has the same permissions, you should be able to just install this, configure it, and go. Okay, great. We have time for one more question. How about the Pi with echo link for a two meter repeater? How do you connect that? I haven't done it yet. Um, I've configured Echolink on a Windows PC uh, to use as a standalone node. Um, I have the whole project uh, spelled out and linked so I can set it up on a Pi because we do have a project up here in the Catskills that we wanted to set up for that. I haven't done it yet. 
I know it works. Uh, I've hit some nodes that are running on Pies, and uh, and they work. Um, as far as as far as the audio interface part of it, you know, you have four USB ports to work with. Uh, one of your once you're running this thing headless, you can get pretty sophisticated with the audio interlinks. Um, and because uh, we know there are some very sophisticated repeaters out there for getting the audio to work right. But just for a simple setup, I would say uh, USB audio dongle um, and the Pi implementation of Echolink. The hardest part of Echolink is not going to get to be to get it running on a Pi. If you've never worked with Echolink before, the hardest part is Echolink itself. Um, as a user of Echolink, it's easy, but setting up an Echolink node to run correctly is not always easy. There's so many parameters you have to worry about. So um, I'm going to uh, end. I assume you said that was the last one. Yeah, that, well, we have a whole bunch of other questions, but what I suggest is anybody else with a question, Neil is going to give you his contact information again. Please send your question along. I'm sure he'll be happy to answer it. And Neil, thank you very much. You're welcome. And uh, as we uh, close out here, this is where I'm sitting. I'm sitting in that chair that you see on the screen. That's my current setup. You can see the Pi 400 to the left, the IC7100 to my right elbow. And uh, I can uh, remote from machine to machine to machine. And even into the Windows server, that'll be running my shack once I get it all set up. So best way to get a hold of me is Neil at neilgoldstein.com. And if you go to neilgoldstein.com and click on Fofio, as I said in the presentation, I'll have a whole uh, page posted with answers to the questions I didn't know the answers to. Uh, the presentation will be there and just regular links um, to things we talked about in the presentation. Um, I'm glad I got a couple extra minutes here, George. Thank you. And um, I think going forward, um, we'll try to get uh, some back and forth dialogue with some of the users, um, maybe uh, through one of the groups IO groups or even uh, on a YouTube page. We'll see. Um, I'll try to uh, let everybody know what I'm doing. And that's it. W2NDG, 7-3 to all. Okay. Thank you all. Thanks, Neil. You're welcome.